Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by The Motive. Ron, how can Motive sponsor the show? The light of lights always looks on the motive, not the deed. The shadow of shadows on the deed alone. Eats said that. And I would like to point out, it makes no sense. Neither do these FFMs. Hello? Mr. Barron, this is Ed Chavers. Uh, hello, Constable. I've got some mighty unpleasant news for you, Mr. Barron. Carter Hogue, the high school principal, has been murdered. What? I'll have to ask you to come down to the office for a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask you some questions. Of course, Constable. I'll be right over. <laughs> Constable, this is all a tremendous shock to me. Not only was Carter Hogue my colleague at the school, but one of my best friends as well. I know, Mr. Byrne. It's been a shock to us all. How did it happen? Well, as far as I know, someone crept in through the window of Hogue's house and struck him over the head as he sat in his study. Any clues? Not a one. What I wanted to ask you was if you have any idea as to who could have had a motive for killing him. The only thing I can think of is the threat made by Darrell Lewis's father when he found out that Carter had hit his son. Oh, you heard about that. It's bad business hitting that boy. I was there when it happened. The boy provoked the incident by his surly behavior, but it was unfortunate that Carter lost his temper. Well, that's the only clue I have, so I called Mr. Lewis on the phone right after you. You ought to be here any minute. This all seems like a horrible dream, Constable. You can count on me to help in any way I can. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. I will. Come in. Good evening, Constable. I'm Darrell Lewis's father. Well, come in, please. Any idea why I sent for you? Eh, a little. You must have heard about the threat I made to the principal when I found out he hit my kid. Uh, that was a dangerous thing to say. I lost my head. Hogue had no right to lay a hand on my kid. Mr. Lewis, Carter Hogue is dead. Murdered. Dead. Now, 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 see here. I know what you're thinking, but and you're dead wrong. I'm innocent. You're protesting your innocence rather loudly, Mr. Lewis. Now, look here, Mr. Barron. I'm not the polished gentleman you are, but I can still protect my rights. Doesn't look good for you, my friend. When you threaten to kill a man and then two days later he's murdered, it's more than coincidence. You better close your mouth, teacher, or I'll do it for you. And perhaps I'd better. I don't want to have you sneaking up on me and smashing in my skull with a bookend like you did to poor Carter Hogue. Why, you dirty... Easy there, Mr. Lewis, easy. And you stop this cross-examining, Barron. There'll be plenty of time for it in the courtroom at your trial. What? You killed Carter Hogue, and I can prove it. How does Constable Ed Chevers know that Sam Barron is the murderer of Carter Hogue? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Roan, one guy has a motive and the other, not so much. How ironic. Typical of these mysteries, it's a bait-and-switch tactic. I believe it's universally understood and acknowledged that all men will never act correctly, unless they have a motive to do otherwise. Are you just finding these nonsensical quotes on brainyquote.com? I am. That seems wrong. Perhaps it's better to be irresponsible and right than to be responsible and wrong. Another quote? Winston Churchill. And now, back to our story. Unfortunately for you, Mr. Barron, in your attempt to pin the murder on Mr. Lewis here, you became too dramatic in describing the scene and the action. How did you know that Hogue had been struck with a bookend? 
I didn't tell you, and you hadn't seen the body. Only the man who committed the murder could have known what the weapon was. You protested Mr. Lewis's guilt too loudly, Mr. Barron. You only proved him innocent. Any more quotes? Just this one by Aesop. After all is said and done, more is said than done. That seems to be the defeatist attitude. Or it could just be a summation of the nature of these five-minute mysteries. Or just another random quote. I can neither confirm nor deny that. What's that you say? Hello and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we're doing something special. We're going to take a close look at the old-time radio series, The Columbia Workshop. This was a unique show and one of the pioneers of modern radio. More about that later. We have a Bigfoot story from a listener in Buffalo, New York. It takes place in an area of Washington State that I'm pretty familiar with, the Pacific Crest Trail. This is one of the best hiking trails in the world. So sit back and relax as we begin with this review of the audiobook, Selected Stories of Harry Bates. Who is he? Well, let's find out. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? The Day the Earth Stood Still Selected Stories of Harry Bates, narrated by William Kuhn. Now, you might be thinking that this is based on the 1951 or 2008 film. You would be wrong. Before these movies were ever made, the story Farewell to the Master first appeared in the October 1940 issue of Astounding Stories. It became the basis for the 1951 film. The story was morphed from Bates' original conception into a cerebral science fiction cinematic classic. Much of the sense of wonder of that original story was lost in its adaptation to film. In fact, a fundamental characteristic that can be found in the stories by Bates is a sense of wonder. While other authors' stories generally held an optimistic view of humankind, Harry Bates' sensibilities were often much darker. He dealt with philosophy, including the metaphysical, with mind-exploding ideas that predated similar explorations by such authors as Robert Heinlein and Philip K. Dick. In Farewell to the Master, Cliff Sutherland, a freelance reporter, is determined to get more photos of the giant robot that stands as silent sentinel over his dimensional space-traveling ship. Cliff is determined to have an overnight vigil to get behind the mystery of the slain alien known as Klaatu. Here's a clip from that story. A slight rustling sound came from speakers hidden in the ceiling above, and at once the noises of the crowd lessened. The recorded lecture was about to be given. Cliff sighed. He knew the thing by heart, had even been present when the recording was made, 
and met the speaker, a young chap named Stillwell. Ladies and gentlemen, began a clear and well-modulated voice. But Cliff was no longer attending. The shadows in the hollows of Gnut's face and figure were deeper. It was almost time for his shot. He picked up and examined the proofs of the pictures he had taken the day before and compared them critically with the subject. As he looked, a wrinkle came to his brow. He had not noticed it before, but now, suddenly, he had the feeling that since yesterday something about Gnut was changed. The pose before him was the identical one in the photographs. Every detail on comparison seemed the same, but nevertheless the feeling persisted. He took up his viewing glass and more carefully compared subject and photographs, line by line. And then he saw that there was a difference. With sudden excitement, Cliff snapped two pictures at different exposures. He knew he should wait a little and take others, but he was so sure he had stumbled on an important mystery that he had to get going, and quickly folding his accessory equipment, he descended the ladder and made his way out. Twenty minutes later, consumed with curiosity... He was developing the new shots in his hotel bedroom. What Cliff saw when he compared the negatives taken yesterday and today caused his scalp to tingle. Here was a slant indeed, and apparently no one but he knew. Still, what he had discovered, though it would have made the front page of every paper in the solar system, was after all only a lead. The story, what really had happened, he knew no better than anyone else. It must be his job to find out, and that meant he would have to secrete himself in the building and stay there all night. That very night, there was still time for him to get back before closing. He would take a small, very fast infrared camera that could see in the dark, and he would get the real picture and the story. He snatched up the little camera, grabbed an air cab, and hurried back to the museum. The place was filled with another section of the ever-present queue, and the lecture was just ending. He thanked heaven that his arrangement with the museum permitted him to go in and out at will. He had already decided what to do. First, he made his way to the floating guard and asked a single question, and anticipation broadened on his face as he heard the expected answer. The second thing was to find a spot where he would be safe from the eyes of the men who would close the floor for the night. There was only one possible place, the laboratory set up behind the ship. Boldly, he showed his press credentials to the second guard, stationed at the partitioned passageway leading to it, stating that he had come to interview the scientists, and in a moment was at the laboratory door. He had been there a number of times and knew the room well. It was a large area, roughly partitioned off for the work of the scientists engaged in breaking their way into the ship, and full of a confusion of massive and heavy objects, electric and hot air ovens, Carboys of chemicals, asbestos sheeting, compressors, basins, ladles, a microscope, and a great deal of smaller equipment common to a metallurgical laboratory. Three white-smocked men were deeply engrossed in an experiment at the far end. Cliff, waiting a good moment, slipped inside and hid himself under a table half buried with supplies. He felt reasonably safe from detection there. Very soon now the scientists would be going home for the night. From beyond the ship he could hear another section of the waiting queue filing in, the last, he hoped, of the day. He settled himself as comfortably as he could. In a moment the lecture would begin. He had to smile when he thought of one thing the recording would say. Then there it was again, the clear, trained voice of the chap Stillwell. The foot scrapings and whispers of the crowd died away and Cliff could hear every word in spite of the great bulk of the ship lying interposed. Ladies and gentlemen, began the familiar words, the Smithsonian Institution welcomes you to its new interplanetary wing. This audiobook includes other stories written by Harry Bates. Alas, All Thinking is a story of one man's journey to the end of humanity. A matter of size takes the listener for a journey of scale and the meaning of identity. And finally, Death of a Sensitive is the tale of a psychic who is thought to be mad with his benevolent treatment towards the cockroaches that infest his apartment. 
This one is a forgotten classic that is presented in this audiobook for the first time in over 50 years. In all, there are four classic short novels from the legend that is Harry Bates, who made the golden age of science fiction what it was. Now, if this audiobook appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have The Day the Earth Stood Still selected stories of Harry Bates for free. Now, here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So to download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. If you do, you'll be helping the show out. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. This week, we have a great story sent in by Jeremy Vaughn from Buffalo, New York. I received this story in two parts. I think you'll know what I mean in a second. Here is Jeremy's first email. Hello, Ron. Love your show and tell everyone that will listen about it. Also, I love your artwork each week. I look forward to that almost as much as I do the podcast. Thank you for both. I have a story to tell you, but I'm also working on a book I call Jeremy's story. I want to use this there and would rather not lose the rights to it, to you. Can we have the best of both worlds type thing? Jeremy. Well, I immediately replied with this. Yes, we can. Certainly we can have the best of both worlds. By allowing me to tell your story does not mean you lose the right to tell it yourself. Think of it this way. Two guys have a UFO experience together in the Tuscany Mountains. They both decide to write a book about their experience. Both books tell the same story, but yet are completely independent copyrights. The same thing applies here. Yes, I own the rights to my show, but you own the rights to your book. You couldn't include my podcast in your book without my permission, and I can't read your book on the show without your approval. So please, send in your story, and I will share it with everyone. I'm still surprised by how many people worry about this. Last year, I had to drop a story that was both inspirational and amazing because in the end, the person wouldn't believe that simple truth. I don't own anything except the rights to my own show. So please, if you have a story, don't let that be the reason you don't send it in. You don't lose your copyrights. Now, for the good news. Let's hear Jeremy's story. I think you're going to find it incredibly amazing. It was the summer of 2005, and I was on a backpacking trip in your neck of the woods, the Pinchot National Forest. I've always wanted to do at least part of the Pacific Crest Trail. It spans over 2,600 miles from Mexico to Canada through California, Oregon, and Washington. It reveals the beauty of the desert, unfolds the glaciated expanses of the Sierra Nevada, travels deep into the forests, and provides commanding vistas of the volcanic peaks in the Cascade Range. Now, I didn't write that. That was directly from their homepage. We found a nice hotel in the city of Stevenson, Washington, and spent our first couple of days there packing and making final preparations for the trip. I would be going with my older brother James and my younger sister, 
Jenny. Yes, all our names begin with J. My dad is Jerry, and my mom is also a Jenny. Anyway, we hired a local to come pick us up at the Mount St. Helens Monument some five days hence. That would mean we would be hiking about 30 miles, give or take. Excited, we hired a cab to take us out the next morning to the beginning of the Pinchot Forest and the Pacific Crest Trail. Hiking is a wondrous thing. You can never know what is going to be around the next bend. All sense of time, life issues, and problems fade away with each step. We saw many wondrous things, all documented via camera or journal entries. The fact was we were no longer an executive, art dealer, and financial consultant. We were just three siblings out in the world, just as God meant us to be. We had moments of fun, heart-pounding vistas, and even a black bear encounter. But nothing prepared us for that third night out. We had just finished making camp, and Jenny was working on the evening meal when the first scream came out of the darkness. I can't describe the sound exactly, but think of a male screaming at the top of their lungs then lower that by several octaves. It bellowed through the forest like an explosive thunderstrike and then faded away. It was replaced by an eerie silence that lasted for several seconds. Then, a second scream, this one higher than the first, and it echoed from a different location. It was followed by sounds that can only be equated as the beating of a drum perhaps a hollowed-out log or dead trees, who can say, but there was some sort of rhythm to it. This too stopped and then was responded to with a third scream from even further away. Then everything went quiet. And when I say quiet, I don't mean forest sounds quiet. It was dead silence. Not a single sound came from around us. It was as if the entire world had stopped in that very moment. We all agreed not to bring any sort of electronics with us, so we had no real way of knowing how long it lasted, but eventually the normal night sounds returned and things were set to right. We went back to our evening activities. Dinner, a game of cards, general chatter, and even a deep discussion of what had happened. The rest of the night, and the trip for that matter, was uneventful. We had the time of our lives and never regretted a single moment of our adventure. When I returned home, I decided to look up to see what may have been the cause of the scream and drums. The only explanation offered was that we had encountered and intercepted Bigfoot communication. That's right, Bigfoot calling Bigfoot. Jeremy Vaughn, Buffalo, New York. Wow, thank you, Jeremy, for your story. I have to say I've hiked that very same area many times in my life although I've only gone about seven miles into the Pinchot National Forest. The trail begins very close to the famous Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River. I've never had the pleasure of an encounter with Bigfoot, but I've heard many stories similar to yours told to me by people that I respect. I've always believed that there is something there. If you want to know more about the Pacific Crest Trail or Bigfoot encounters that have happened in the region, I will have links to both in the show notes. To Jeremy, I say, man, I can't wait to read your book. If this is a sample of what we can expect, please get to it sooner than later. Our featured story this week 
isn't a story at all. It was an experiment by CBS that began in July of 1936. Radio was still a very new thing and early pioneers wanted to figure out what the boundaries were of this new medium. Columbia Workshop was a series that separated itself from popular radio of the time. Their experiments led to several revelations in the methods in which shows were made. This included the development of the soundboard, now considered essential to radio and podcast production. Irving Rees created Columbia Workshop after working as a sound engineer and radio director. Rees was excited about using the show as a platform for radio sound and narrative experimentation. He believed that radio was a distinct and novel medium where sound effects could vividly bring the radio show to life in homes across America. In 1937, he produced Alice in Wonderland. This was an experiment with radio sound effects and effective, brilliant acting. Throughout all of the shows, Columbia Workshop drew its stories from classic literature such as William Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, T.S. Eliot, Lewis Carroll, and many more. Orson Welles starred in a two-part adaptation of Hamlet. The workshop was well received by radio audiences and the show remained popular for decades. Because it was sound-based, its era came to an end with the advent of televisions, as most radio shows did. So what are we going to hear today? Well, I found a very poor recording of the very first episode of the show. I cleaned it up as best I could, and it pretty much explains itself. I hope that you enjoy this. My suggestion to you is this. As you listen, imagine yourself listening to the radio on a warm night on July 18th, 1936. The Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Irving Reese. Ladies and gentlemen, Columbia takes pride in inaugurating tonight a new series of programs dedicated to you and to the magic of radio, the Columbia Workshop. The Columbia Workshop believes in radio, in its past accomplishments, and in its promise for the future. Radio has reduced the area of the world to a split second of time for the transmission of human thought and feeling through man's literature, his music, his spoken word. In the five centuries that bridged the years since Gutenberg invented movable type and gave the world the store of man's knowledge through the printed word, no discovery has promised greater potentialities for shaping the world's culture than the slim, swift path of the electric wave. With the speed of light, it cuts through the barriers of boundary, class, race, and distance. While these words, electrically amplified 100 trillion times from the microphone to the transmitters which hurl them on the air, are being sent to you on broadcast bands, a hundred other bands in the radio spectrum are busily engaged performing useful functions for man. At this second somewhere, 20,000 feet above the Earth's surface, giant aerial transport planes are winging their way above clouds, through night and fog, following the straight, invisible electric path of the radio beam signal, which guides them unerringly to their destination. On the high seas, or near treacherous shoals and reef strewn waters, the signal of the radio compass station points the way for mariners when the stars are hidden and the sextant useless. In hospitals throughout the world, electrical surgery and shortwave artificial fever machines, radio's contribution to medicine, are helping scientists in their onslaught against disease and pain. The Columbia Workshop dedicates itself to the purposes of familiarizing you with the story behind radio, both in broadcasting as well as in aviation, shipping, communication, and pathology, and to experiment in new techniques with the hope of discovering or evolving new and better forms of radio presentation, with a special emphasis on radio drama, to encourage and present the work of new writers and artists who may have fresh and vital ideas to contribute. The workshop earnestly asks your participation in these and future experiments. Your response alone will enable us to judge our progress, and we shall appreciate your letters, your criticisms, and your suggestions. 
Now, tonight we wish to try an unusual experiment in dramatic presentation. We're going to present two well-known short plays. One has been written for the microphone and one for little theater presentation. In the radio play, a comedy of danger by Richard Hughes, first produced by the British Broadcasting Company, the author created his setting for radio's dimensions alone. It would be almost impossible to present this play properly on a stage or on a screen. We shall attempt to produce the play, giving it every advantage of radio technique. And after you hear a comedy of danger, we shall present Percival Wilde's one-act play, The Finger of God. This play will be presented with a technique never attempted in radio before. Mr. Myron Sattler, well-known director of the Little Theater, has been asked to stage this play in the studio exactly as if he were presenting it before a theater audience. The performers will pay no attention to the microphone. They'll move around as the stage business demands on a special set which we have erected in the studio. Through the cooperation of the Columbia Engineering Department, a parabolic microphone, which can be focused like a spotlight, will be trained on the actors from a distance of 20 feet and will follow their movements as they go through the business the play calls for. But first, the radio play, A Comedy of Danger. A gallery in a Welsh coal mine, 1,000 feet below the surface of the earth. The lights are gone What's happened? Where are you? Here. Where? I can't find you. Here. I'm holding my hand up. I can't find you. Well, right here. Oh! <laughs> it's all right. It's only me. Oh, you did frighten me. Touching me suddenly like that. I had no idea you were so close. Get her in my hand. Whatever happens, we, we, we mustn't do these things. Oh, that's better. But the lights. Why have they gone out? I don't know. I suppose something's gone wrong with the dining room. They'll, they'll turn them up again in a minute. Oh, Jack, I hate the dark. Cheer up, darling. It'll be all right in a minute or two. So frightfully dark down here. No wonder. There must be nearly a thousand feet of rock between us and the daylight. Not surprising to bit dusk here. I didn't know there could be such utter blackness as this ever. It's so dark, it's as if there was never such a thing as light anywhere. Oh, Jack, it's like being blind. They'll turn the lights up again soon. I wish we'd never come down to this beastly mine. I knew something would go wrong. It'll be all right, dear. It's, it's only the light. Where are the others? Oh, they're just on ahead, not far. Suppose we get lost. We can't get lost, Mary, darling. The others will stand still, too, so the lights go up, and then we can easily overtake them. You've only got to wait patiently. I wish you hadn't wanted to drop behind the others. Oh, Jack, I'm afraid of the dark. Oh, my mistake. Buck up, Mary, oh, good. It'll soon be over. Listen. Oh, it's Mr. Back. Hello. Hello, who's there? Oh, Mr. Back, what happened? Is it all right? Is it all right, indeed? Leaving us suddenly in the dark like this. But there has been an accident. Oh, goodness knows. I'd expect anything of a country like Wales. Wretched incompetence. The houses are full of cockroaches. Ah, well, I suppose the only thing to do is to sit wait for the light to go up again. There's no danger. <laughs> no danger, young lady, but it's dead unpleasant. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm beginning to think it's rather fun. Well, if you can find any fun in breaking your shins in the dark. Why oh. don't you call it fun? Being in a mine disaster? Uh, but uh, this isn't a disaster. It's only the light. No, oh, of course it is. You don't think it would be fun if it were a real disaster, do you? But the light going out might have been a disaster. And think how silly it's going to be to talk about it afterwards. I think that. Yes? Let's pretend it's silly. Uh, what do you mean? Well, let's pretend it's a real disaster. And we'll coop up here forever, and we'll never be able to get out. Don't go about it. Well, no. There's no real danger, is there? Let's get all the thrills we can. With all the morbid ideas, young people nowadays... I'm not thrilled. Let's pretend the roof's falling in. And they can't get out. <laughs> All right. The baby you are. Here we are, my dear. There is the light. Oh, Jack. Alas, they will never find us. Oh, Jack. Well? I'm so frightened. What is that? About the roof having fallen in. But well, it's candid. It's so it's a test. Yes, but when I pretend, it seems so real. Well, then don't pretend. But I want to pretend. I want to be frightened. <laughs> Only hold my hand tight, won't you? Go on. We shall suffocate or starve or both, my dear, in each other's eyes. Oh, Jack. Even death shall not pass us. Oh, Jack, don't. It's too awful. Our poor young life 
Cut so short. Oh, no. No. Yeah, the articles is all the newspaper. I wish I could read them. Well, you can't have your funeral and watch it, young lady. Oh, this is fun. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Ah! 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 Quiet. Let's go. Your father came. Keep going. I don't think we could, young lady. It wouldn't um, be much use in the if we did. The echo's getting loud. Yes, it is an It is water. The mine's flooding. We'll be drowned. Oh, dear, it's an echo. Oh, Jack, I don't want to die. I won't. I won't. I won't. Oh, it's, it's got to come sometime, young lady. Isn't it better for us that now in your love and arms, both of you together? You old fool, it's very well with this joyful about death at your age, but we're young. He's got all life before us. Well, can't you keep quiet about it then, you young Japanese? Do you think I want to die either? It isn't good manners to talk about it. Oh, would it be if we all started screaming about it, eh? We can at least die that like gentleman. Indeed, I, I tell you, it's very well for an old chap like you who'll die anyhow in a year or two. But it's different for us, way down. Well, if you want to make a scene, you shall have one, sir. Do you think it's any easier for the old to die than the young... I think it's harder, sir, harder. Life is like a trusted friend. There's more pressure than the years go by. Ah, oh, what's your life worth to the world? Who's dependent on you? What good are you to anyone? Well, what, what good are you, young man? One person is dependent on me anyway. You mean that you're loved by this young lady? You both die. What loss is that to the world? Lots of these quantities cancelling out. Oh, you no, please. You cruel I, I must treat madam in common justice to my age. Since that young cub has started the subject. The old law is being treated with her unwillingness to die. Look here, instead of talking like this, let's do something. Let, let's make some sort of an attempt to escape. What do you propose to do, young man? Why, look for some way out. We can't stay here and drown like rats in a cage. Oh, the dark. I do hate the dark. I think I could go more easily if I could see one. Just what what happened. It's coming closer. Listen. Yes. You'll be honest in another five minutes. Pray heaven it. Oh, think of dying somewhere out in the open, in the sunlight. Me able to see you, and you able to see me. What bliss that will be. Strange. How little cats wonder what will happen after death. One hardly thinks about it. Yet I don't know. How thrilled we should be if, if we met a chap who really knew. In five minutes, we're going to know ourselves. Oh, I've always wanted to travel. Now I'm going to. Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> dear. You know, I'm beginning to feel as excited about it as a child going to the seaside for the first time. Aren't you? Yes. How queer you are. I never looked at it like that. Well, I, I wasn't in any hurry to die, but now it's coming up. I feel sort of proud of myself, as if it was a wonderful thing to manage to pull off. Oh, Jack, There's darling. only one thing I'm sorry about. What is it? My work. If it wasn't for that, I'd go to death without carrying a tuppenny damn. I'd die just for the fun of the thing, to see what it felt like. I shouldn't worry about that if I were you. The world would get on all right without you, never you fear. What is your work? I write poetry, sir. And you call that work? Jack, the water's coming. It's over my feet. Oh, Curly, darling. Jack, I don't want to die. I hate it. I loathe it. I want to live. You don't make it harm, do you? You don't make it fun for me, do you, having to die? Jack, it's awful. Only for one more hour. Oh, I do want to live another hour. Oh, God, can't I be allowed to finish my work? Not your work, sir. You think you're the only, the only one dying before his time? I tell you, every man dies before his time. Even if he lives till he's as old as Methuselah. Oh. It's Don't touch at me like that, Mary. It, it won't do any good. For the water, the current's washing me away. Hold tight, then. Got too tight. Oh, if I could only see you. Just, just think of all the things I meant to do. Oh, shut up about the things you meant to do, you young cub. When you realize we're all in the same boat, and it is hard for me to die as it is for you. 
Oh, worse, my dad. A thousand times worse. You hurry, old sinner. Can't you prepare to get out of the world instead of cursing at me? Oh, Jack, let's pray. Pray if you like, Mary. I can't. Oh, Jack, no. Uh, uh, I can't die. I'm an old man. I won't. I won't. Oh, hold yourself in, you old coward. Oh, Mr. Bat. I'm quite calm now. I don't mind dying. It's no good, Mr. Bat. No one can possibly hear us. The only thing is to keep calm. It won't be long now. Help! 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 What's that? Help! 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 What's happening? We're here! Find our alarm! They'll find our bodies. They'll find us if they're quick enough. Find our alarm! Still! That's right! They can't be quick enough. Besides, I don't want them to find me. Help! Make quick of your fools! Quick of your drowning! Oh, I can't do the hate sense of this. Yes, darling. I'll never leave you. How do you know they let you stay with him, you little fool? What do you know of death? Death means nothing. Not even a breath of the wind or a mere drop of the rain. Not even a dirty ghost dragging its chains on the staircase. It's up to my chin. Help me. Let me lift you in my arms, darling. Then when he gets up to my chin, we'll die together. Tell me, it isn't true what he's been saying. No, no, darling. Of course it's not true. Hurry up, you ghost! You blockhead! Back your in! We're drowning, I tell you! Drowning! Quick! Quick! Oh, my God, dear. They must be nearly through. Oh, this, this suspense! How much longer before we know that we're going to live or die? I don't care which, but I do want to know! Look! There's a light! A hole in the roof! Quick! Quick! They're through! Quick! Right below there! Catch on to the roof! Quick! I'm an old man! There's a girl here! My God, Jack. Let me see. Come along, young lady. I've got the rope. Thank you. No, no, never mind. Pass that up here. You'll be all right. I'll give you something to write about too, my boy. All right about there. Have you got her? Right. Alba, Nick. Up you go. Quick, Mr. Beck. The water's still here. You're right. No, my boy. Up you. You're more value in the world than I am. Nonsense, sir. Up you. You're an older man than I am. Quick now. There won't be time. You, you've got nearly to think of now, Jack. Hold away above there. No, no. Stay with me. It's me you're holding up. You don't want to be back. No we'll have you up first. There's no time to wait. I... No, we're away again. Hello there. Hey, back. Catch on. Have you got it? Hi. And now we are about to present Percival Wilde's play, The Finger of God, with a technique heretofore untried in radio. An engineer is stationed about 20 feet from the performers, focusing a parabolic microphone on them as they move around the especially set stage. This will allow them an unrestricted movement, which ordinarily cannot be done in present radio production. Percival Wilde's The Finger of God. The living room of Strickland's apartment. As the curtain rises, he is kneeling and burning some papers in a grate near the main door. Benson, his valet, is packing a suitcase, which lies open on the writing desk. Benson? Yes, sir? Close the window. It's cold. Yes, sir. Why, sir, the window's cold. Things are going Benson? Yes, sir? Don't forget a heavy overcoat. I've put it in already, sir. Plenty of fresh linen? Yes, sir. Collars and ties? I've looked out for everything, sir. You sent off the trunks this afternoon? Yes. You're sure they can't be traced? I had one wagon taken to a vacant lot. And another wagon taken to the station. Good. I checked them through to Chicago. Here are the checks. What train do we take? I take the midnight. You follow me sometime next week. We mustn't be seen leaving town together. How will I find you in Chicago? You won't. You'll take room somewhere, and I'll take room somewhere else till it's all blown over. 
When I want you, I'll put an ad in the Tribune. You, uh, you don't know when that will be, sir. As soon as I think it's safe. Maybe two weeks, it's maybe a couple of months. But you'll stay in Chicago until you hear from me one way or the other, you understand? Yes, sir. Have you plenty of money? Not enough to last a couple of months. Well, how much do you want? Five or six hundred. Wait a minute, I left that much in my bureau drawer. Oh, uh, uh Mr. Strickland? Yes? It's the midnight train to Chicago, isn't it? Yes. Hello? Hello, hello, this is This is Tennyson. He's going to take the midnight train to Chicago, Pennsylvania. You'd better arrest him at the station. If he wants to get to Chicago, you'll never find him. And, uh, uh, Sidney, you won't forget me, will you? I want $5,000 for it. Yes, yes, $5,000. Oh, that's little enough. He's got almost 300000 on him. You won't turn in all of that to the headquarters, will you? Yes, this is cash. Large bill. Uh, midnight to Chicago. Here's your money, Benson. Thank you, sir. Uh, shall I go now? No, wait a minute. Hello, Pennsylvania? I want a compartment in Chicago, midnight train. Yes, tonight. No, give your own name. No. The name is Stephen. Would oh, you have one reserved in that name already? Well, this is Alfred Stephen. You have it reserved in that name? Then give me another compartment. What? You haven't any other? Never mind. Goodbye. Benson, go right down to the Pennsylvania and get the compartment reserved for Alfred Stephen. You've got to get there before he does. Wait for me at the train gate. Yes, sir. I don't waste any time. I'll see you later. Very well, sir. Who's there? I'm Who are you? Why, don't you remember me, sir? No. I'm from the office, sir. The office? Your office. I'm one of your personal stenographers, sir. Oh, I suppose I didn't recognize you on account of the hat. Well, what do you want? There was a letter which came late this afternoon. You're bothering me with them now. I've got some time. For that, you'd better go. I thought you'd want to see these letters. Plenty of time tomorrow. But you won't be here tomorrow, will you? I won't be here? What do you mean? You're taking the train to Chicago tonight. Well, how did you know? Taking a train to Chicago? Of course not. What put that into your head? Why, you told me, sir. I told you? You said so this afternoon. I didn't see you this afternoon. No, sir. Then I found this timetable. Where did you find it? On your desk, sir. On my desk? Yes, sir. You're lying. Mr. Strickland. That timetable never reached my desk. I lost it between the railroad station and my office. Did you, sir? But it's the same timetable you see. You checked the midnight train. I reserved a compartment for you. You reserved a compartment? I knew you'd forget it. You have your head so full of other things. So I telephoned as soon as you left the office. I suppose you made the reservation in my own name? No, sir. I thought you'd prefer some other name. You didn't want your trip to be known. No, I didn't. What name did you give? Stephen, sir. <laughs> Alfred Stephen. What made you choose that name? I don't know, sir. You don't know? No, sir. It was just the first name that popped into my head. I said Stevens, and when the clerk asked for the first name, I said Alfred. Have you ever known anybody of that name? No, sir. You're sure you never knew anybody of that name? How can I be sure? I may have. I don't remember it. How old are you? You're not 20, are you? You think so? And I'm 47. It was more than 25 years ago. You couldn't have known. No, sir. What is your name? Does it matter? You didn't recognize my face a few minutes ago. My name can't mean much to you. I'm just one of the office force. I'm the girl who answers when you push the button three times. These are the matters I brought with me. Well, what are they about? Well, this one's from a woman who wants to invest some money. How much? Only a thousand dollars. Why didn't you turn it over to the clerk? The savings of a lifetime, she says. 
What of it? Well, she wrote that she had confidence in you. She says she wants you to invest it for her yourself. You shouldn't have bothered me with that. Did she enclose the money? Yes, a certified check. Well, write her that... Oh, you know what to write. But I'll give the matter my own attention. Yes, sir. She says she doesn't want a big return on her investment. She wants something that'll be perfectly safe. And she knows you'll take care of her. Yes, of course. Well, what else have you? A dozen other letters like it. All from old women? Some of them. Why did you bring them here? Every one of these letters asks you to do the investing yourself. Oh. And you're leaving town tonight. Here are the checks. Every one of them's made out to you personally, not to the firm. You shouldn't have come here. I haven't time to bother with that sort of thing. Every man who has five dollars to invest asks the head of the firm to attend to it himself. It means nothing. I get hundreds of letters like those. Still. Well, what? You must do something to deserve such letters or they wouldn't keep on coming in. It's wonderful to inspire such confidence in people. Do you really think so? Oh, it's more than wonderful. It's magnificent. These people don't know you from Adam. Not one in a hundred has seen you. But they've all heard of you. And what's even more real than you is your reputation. Something in which they rest their absolute confidence. So you think there are few honest men? No, there are many of them. But there's something about you that's different. Something in the tone of your voice and the way you shake hands. Something in the look of your eye that's reassuring. Oh, there's never a doubt, never a question about you. It's splendid, simply splendid. What a satisfaction it must be to you to walk along the street and know that everyone you meet must say to himself, there goes an honest man. It's been an inspiration to me. To you? Oh, I, I know you don't remember who I am. But you don't imagine that anyone can see you as I've seen you, work with you as I've worked with you, without there being some kind of an effect. You know, in my own trouble... Oh, you have trouble. Oh, you don't pay me a very big salary, and there are others whom I'm he- I must help. But I'm not complaining. I used to be like the other girls. I used to watch the clock and count the hours and the minutes till the day's work was over. But it's different now. How different? I thought it over. Made up my mind that it wasn't right to count the minutes you worked for an honest man. Are you sure I'm an honest man? Don't you know it yourself, Mrs. Strickland? Remember a few minutes ago you spoke the name of Alfred Stevens? Yes. Suppose I told you there once was an Alfred Stevens. Suppose I told you that Stevens, whom I knew, stole money. Stole it when there was no excuse for it, when he didn't need it. His people had plenty and they gave him plenty. But the chance came and he couldn't resist the temptation. He was 18 years old then. He didn't even know what to do with the money when he had stolen it. They caught him in less than 24 hours. It was almost funny. He was punished. He served a year in jail. And what a year. His folks wouldn't do a thing for him. They said such a thing had never happened in their family. He told his family that he never wanted to see them again. He changed his name so they couldn't find him. He left his hometown. He came here. And he's been honest ever since. Ever since. For 28 years. It was hard at times, terribly hard. He managed to live. It wasn't pleasant living. It wasn't even decent living, but he stayed alive. I don't like to think of what he did to stay alive. He thought the year in jail was terrible. The first year he was free was worse. He'd never been hungry in jail. Then his chance came. Yes, it was a chance. He found a purse in the gutter, and he returned it to the owner before he made up his mind whether to keep it or not. The man who owned the purse gave him a job. Then they said he was a hard worker. And they promoted him. They made him manager. They gave him more chances to steal. But there were so many men watching him, so many men anxious for him to make a slip so that they might climb over him that he didn't dare. And then? Well, the rest was easy. Nothing succeeds like a good reputation. And he didn't steal because he knew they'd catch him. But he wasn't honest at bottom. The rotten streak was still there. After 28 years, things began to be bad. He speculated, lost all his money and made up his mind to take other money that wasn't his. It was wrong. It was the work of a lifetime gone. But it was the rottenness in him coming to the surface. It was the thief he thought dead coming to life again. What a pity. He'd been honest so long, he'd made other people think he was honest. Was he wrong, Mr. Strickland? Stephen, please. Look, I don't know what sent you, who sent you, but you've come here tonight as I'm running away. Well, you're too late. You can't stop me. Not even the finger of God himself could stop me. I've gone too far. Look, here's money. Hundreds of thousands of it, not a cent of it mine. And I'm stealing it, do you understand me? Stealing it. 
Tomorrow the firm will be bankrupt, and there'll be a reward out for me. Here, if you please, is your honest man. What have you to say to him now? The man has been honest so long that he's made himself think he's honest. Can't steal. You believe that? I was left a little money this week, only a few hundred dollars. Hardly enough to bother you with. Will you take care of it for me, Alfred Stephen? Good God. What a beautiful night. Thousands of sleeping houses, millions of shining stars, and the light beneath. And in the distance how the stars and the light meet, so that one cannot say, here God ends, here man begins. Yes? You're afraid I'm going to miss the train? Well, I am going to miss it. I'm going to stay here and face the music. I'm an honest man, do you hear me? I'm an honest man. There. Did you hear what I told him? Did you hear what I... Why, where are you? Where are you? She was never here at all. The Columbia Workshop has presented as its first program a demonstration of radio and stage technique. Will you write and tell us how you liked the demonstrations and whether or not the illusion in the stage play had any advantages or disadvantages over the radio presentation? The Columbia Workshop presentation was conceived and directed by Irving Reese. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, what did you think of that? I would love to hear your comments and reactions on this one. I thought long and hard about playing it because the quality of the show was not the best. If you want to hear more of these experiments on the origin of radio, there are about 300 surviving episodes of the CBS Workshop on the Internet Archives. I will have a link to them in the show notes. As I mentioned, the CBS Workshop was the creation of Irving Reese. Reese began his career as a motion picture photographer. The most notable of his screen efforts was being one of the photographers for the Hollywood Review of 1929. A 1931 notice in Variety declared that he was transitioning into a playwright. By 1933, Variety took notice of his radio play, The St. Louis Blues. Of course, radio stuck, and that's a good thing, else we wouldn't have had today's stories. Well, that was episode number 594 and we're getting awfully close to 600. Jeremy Vaughn from Buffalo provided our story this time, and it was good. Remember, if you have a story to share, we want to hear it. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.